Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening, y'all? Today we got we got uh, Chris Grenzig in the building, which you guys know very well, I'm sure, if you're following my stuff, because he's, uh, like I said, a brother, a local brother here, and uh, it, we're overdue, man. I'm actually ashamed. It's funny. I almost forgot he didn't come on the show because we talk every day and stuff. I just assumed mm-hmm. he just associated. So, so Chris, man, so if you guys don't know Chris, I got to give the... He's going to give you guys a humble introduction. I don't want to do all that. So Chris is uh, from my neck of the woods, but he's messing out of t- state with uh, – it's Toro, right, Chris? Toro? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you guys are – congratulations on your latest deal. Yes, right, 117 thank you. units out of Jacksonville. Uh, you guys got about – I think – I don't know if this is including the last one, but $285 million under assets under management at this time? Or is uh, it – How do we – About – 285 acquired we've sold eight properties so it's probably if i had to guess still under management give or take 200 million maybe a little under absolutely absolutely and like what you're like i think you had 4500 multifamily units i don't know if that's going in and out but none none nonetheless man thanks for stepping in here and 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 my goal is to get the people to find out a little bit more. You do, first of all, you do so much. You're an asset manager. We want to find out what that is, but you're also a social uh, media influencer, I would call you. A lot of the content I've learned from you because uh, you do such a good job of getting it out there. So that's what's up. But before that, man, who, who was Chris before? Because I think you're an embodiment of what experimenting is all about. You didn't start off as an asset manager, right? So what, what was the beginning of that, bro? No, not at all. Um, yeah, I mean, the way I typically like to start it is, you know, I graduated college in 2014. Um, so I went to Hofstra University on Long Island, born and raised here. Um, and I was a division one student athlete. And like a lot of student athletes, it was more of a emphasis on the athlete than student. So didn't really have a ton of idea what I was going to do afterwards. No real jobs lined up. I hadn't done any internships, so wasn't really prepared to enter the workforce um, and just got lucky friend knew somebody that was looking for an assistant coach for a division two program up in Massachusetts and Worcester uh, called Assumption College. So, cause I had nothing else and I really liked coaching. I'd always coached youth soccer for many, many years. Um, decided to go up and do that. Try my hand at college coaching, really loved college coaching. Um, problem with it was you have to be willing to move wherever, whenever to scale up in that world, to move up positions and teams and divisions and stuff like that. And I learned very quickly that I just miss New York. I miss my friends. I miss my family. Um, I missed everything about the place except maybe the cost and decided I just wanted to come back. And because that college coaching wasn't really the right fit. Um, so decided to, I did get another coaching job here, but I, I always knew it was a stepping stone to doing something else. Um, and all coaching jobs at that level are part-time. So always had you know two or three jobs while doing that instead of getting another coaching job to, you know, supplement the um, coaching job for college, I got a job as a cold caller for a stock brokerage company, um, small firm, Long Island based. And that was my introduction into, you know, the business world and the investment world and instantly fell in love with the investing side of things. I thought it was crazy interesting. Um, Both of my parents had invested for a number of years and it was like understanding a lot of things that they had done previously by getting into that world. I didn't really understand. It didn't really care, truth be told. Um, and that was kind of like eye opening for me. Um, so learned a bunch there, um, got licensed, but also very quickly realized this wasn't going to be a good fit for me long term either. Um, it's not at all like Wolf of Wall Street. It's not to that level of craziness and absurdity and quite truthfully wrong. Um, but there was a lot of echoes of it. So a lot of the same lines, a lot of the same mentality. Um, and the biggest thing that stuck for me was just, it was all about how much money I could make, how much commission I could make and not necessarily care as much if the client made money or not, which to me just seemed very backwards if you're going to invest people's money. So, um, decided I was going to leave, but while I was doing that, my mom and my cousin bought a flipping course 
and decide to drag me along to it on like a weekend seminar. It was like 10, 12 hours for Saturday and Sunday. And that was my literal first introduction into real estate. I knew literally nothing before that. This was January, 2016. Um, the example I give for how little I knew is I thought asbestos was a type of mold. Um, yeah. Um, little did I know is, you know, a form of a building material. So, you know, for me, it was a very steep learning curve very quickly. So it was nights, weekends, um, learning as much as I could, trying to get up to a step with my mom, my cousin, and then trying to build a flipping business, but ultimately failed. Um, didn't buy a single home, didn't put one under contract, didn't even get close, didn't flip a single property on Long Island for, well, ever, but in that eight month period that we were trying. So you while we're we- wrong, uh, I'm sorry, Chris. What do you think went wrong on that? On that? On the? So the two biggest things operation. It, yeah, it was a couple things, um, but the two biggest things were number one was our lack of execution. So I just know now, especially I know people that are doing it, so I know it's possible, and I always knew it was possible. Um, but number one was definitely lack of execution. Two, we didn't. Well, I'll give three. Two, we didn't do it for nearly long enough. Six, seven, eight months is not a long enough time to continue to do something and overcome failure. However, we, we also weren't set up the best. The program we bought into, um, the way it was done, it was quick calculations based on square footage and all the pricing was wrong because it was set for an area that was not nearly as costly as New York, Miami, LA, whatever. However, I understand, and this is where the lack of execution comes in, we could have taken all those systems, those spreadsheets, those cost estimates and we could have changed them and configured them to make them work for our area. So that's where I say number one is lack of execution, but you know, the first three, four months we wasted so much time banging our head against the wall because we thought these properties would work. And little did we know our rehab budget was just way off. Cause as we dug into it, it would be like 5,000 bucks for a brand new kitchen. And you know, my mom had done a, you know, brand new kitchens on for her own stuff twice my cousin had just bought a new home, done his brand new kitchen. They were like, that's not even close. Like they did super high end and it was like 30, 40, $50,000 for these things. And they said, even if you went mid-level, it's just, it wasn't close. So yeah. could we have taken those systems, those plans and everything and implemented it and changed it? Absolutely. Cause there's other people that are doing it, not necessarily with the same systems and stuff, but it can be done. Um, so primarily lack of execution. Um, but however, what we did do that I thought was smart was, instead of trying to figure it out on our own, because there wasn't a lot of resources for our area, we decided to find someone that was already doing it, give them some sort of resource that we had, whether it was time, energy, uh, connections, capital, whatever, and help them and see if we can gain an inside track. So the way we ended up doing that um, was to be a hard money lender for a flip in Pennsylvania. Um, that was for a guy named Brian and Brian ended up being John Cohen's cousin. And John Cohen is one of the founders and owners at Toro where I work now. Wow. So got introduced to John through there. Um, he was going to introduce us to buying tax deeds at auction down in Philadelphia. Me and my cousin drove down one weekend to go and try that. We thought, Hey, buy, you know, properties for, you know, a couple thousand bucks, a couple hundred bucks, put a ton of money into them, flip them in. It's in a really great location like Philly. And it was just stuff in the rough of the rough areas. And we had eliminated some of the worst zip codes and it was just terrible. Didn't enjoy it. Long trip. My mom flat out refused to drive down. Um, and I'm glad she didn't. And my cousin was already working two jobs. He was about to have his first kid. I saw the writing on the wall. I knew he was not going to have nearly enough time to be able to do this every single weekend like yeah. it was going to entail. So came back, said, you know, thanks, but it's not right for us. And John at the time just happened to be raising money for an eight unit multifamily property in Covington, Kentucky, which is right across the river from Cincinnati. So it's like the Brooklyn of Cincinnati, obviously much smaller, but it was really cool. Um, it was a big gut job renovation. Um, it was like 20 a door purchase. It was like a 20 a door renovation um, in like a C class area. And we just had the same thought process like, hey, maybe, we, you know, if we can put some money into this, we think you know, at the time we thought this was maybe a little bit of a better area um, or a little bit way to do it. Um, Cause you can have property managers, you can do it out of state. You can kind of live where you want, invest where you want, which is something we found very attractive. And, you know, we thought we can leverage his experience. So invested passively and then just started 
talking once a week, every other week, just asking them questions, stuff like that. And just had really good connections, really good synergies right off the bat. Um, because of that, we helped him launch a meetup locally that we were doing basically every month for the past three years. Um, and then we also joint ventured on another 17 units in the same location and then joint ventured on an 82 unit property down in Jacksonville, Florida, which was the first property of seven that we've bought there um, since. So um, that was really cool. And while we were doing that 17 unit, I was still working as a stockbroker. I was still coaching and I was just done. I was ready to quit. I wanted out, you know, and I had hung on for a couple months as best I could to try to get another job lined up before I quit. Um, Cause obviously didn't want to go, you know, unemployed or not making money. And I was at that point, I was like, this is, I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> Lo and behold, just happened to be sitting down with John one day over coffee, small world. He'd worked for the same exact people. I was at the stock brokerage company I get it. five yeah. or six years prior, just at a different company. So we were just talking stuff and just talking about the pros and cons. Now he made the switch and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to leave. He was like, you know what? It's probably a little early, but me and my partner, Don are thinking about bringing someone in to help us out you know, would you want to come in for like a trial basis for like three to six months, see if we can make it work? You know, worst case scenario, you just get some more insight into the business. I was like, yes, I'm in. So met Don, everything was fine. Came in for six months on a trial period, I think, or three months, and then just kept working there. Um, You know, full time moved over. Um, That was August, 2016. Um, And since then, um, like you said, now we've acquired, you know, right around 4,000 units, $285 million worth of properties. Um, and now I'm in a position where basically head up the asset management and acquisitions in Florida and help on both of those aspects and all the other areas. <laughs> wow. That's a crazy story. I'm actually trying to take notes in my map because I, I just like love the crazy connection. And I want to take, take a step back real quick where you mentioned you were doing this with family. Sound like you mother and brother. Um, mother and cousin. Mother and cousin. Okay, got it. And uh, the connection, I guess, initially was you guys. I love how you said the six to seven, eight months wasn't enough for you to even pick up traction because I think 100%. people want to get into this quick fix, right? But mm-hmm. so then, was that what led to the when you found someone who was already doing this? Was that through, um, through just through still, networking? Through through networking. Okay. Yeah. And was that is that was that the connection where you said? what was the hard money? Cause you mentioned hard money. Were you guys going to do hard money? Like, were you going to get, make money off the interest or like, I, I don't know yeah, if I captured so, that correctly. Yeah. So the idea was find someone that was already doing it and doing it successfully and basically saying, Hey, we'll do something for you. We'll help you out. In this case, it just happened to be, be the lender on one of his new properties. We, you know, we'll give you the money all we want in return besides, you know, the return. Just, Hey, can we just ask you some questions, get the inside scoop, understand a little bit more what you're doing because we figured, Hey, if here's somebody that's doing it at least moderately well, it's better than not knowing what we're doing at all or very little or trying to figure it out ourselves. We said, Hey, you know, let's see what happens, right? Worst case scenario, we're a lender on deal. We felt fairly confident that it would work. You know, we had the whole platform for, the program that we bought, we ran the numbers ourselves. It seemed, you know, decent enough. You know, we weren't experts by any means. And, um, you know, we're more relying on that person, Brian, to do it. Um, you know, ended up going okay. He didn't make as much as he thought, but we were made whole. Um, so in that regard, it was successful. But um, yeah, that, that was our thought process. And it was the same thing when John came to us with, you know, the opportunity to invest passively in the eight unit. Um, it was the same process. It was we weren't, we weren't as high up on flips anymore. Um, we just yeah. thought they were more risky than as we learned more and more about it, we were just like, it's a little bit riskier than we would like, pr- would prefer something a little bit more long-term that can probably go through, you know, some sort of a downturn like we're going through now. Um, yeah. God forbid something happens. So we were shifting away from that as well and just had the same thought process of, Hey, you know, what can we do to gain more insight? And that was at first it was investing passively. Then it was, you know, John was thinking about starting the meetup already. And we said, Hey, let us help you. Let us continue to bring value, contribute, things like that. We'll help with, you know, organizing, inviting people, you know, setting up the meetup stuff, all that. So he said, sure. Um, Did that. And then just as we kept talking, you know, we, we decided to try and find, some more properties in that same area. We said, we already own eight units. Let's find more. 
you know, let's help you find properties and we'll come onto your side and we'll take some responsibilities off your plate. So, you know, raise some money, help with the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And he said, sure. So it was just little by little. Um, and then the 82 unit in Jacksonville, Florida was the same thing. It was, we had already done one. Um, we had closed and, you know, it was going, you know, somewhat successful. It hadn't been that long. And again, it was just, you know, let's just continue the trend. It's going well. Um, so, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so the, I guess what I want to get out of that is that when you did the deal initially with Brian, it was, let's just find someone who needs help and help them. Or did you initially think let's go into the lending side of things? Was it more of his demand or was it more of you just trying to, trying to, we were just trying to find someone that was willing to work with us. Like a lot of, we had tried joint venturing on a flip as the flipper, not as the lender. And a lot of people did not want to do that. They just didn't want to split profits. They didn't want to give us the time of day. Yeah. So we had already tried that route of being like, Hey, let's be on that side of the coin. Don't be the lender. So let's see if we can do it with someone who already knows what they're doing and we can try to help them out. And nobody wanted to do that. And I kind of get it now because there was three of us. You try to bring three more people onto a flip, even if it's one other person, you know, even if we weren't asking for a lot, you know, you've got to do work with three other people. That's not a insignificant ask of somebody. I can see why people would say no. Um, yeah. so what we said was, Hey, we'll, you know, let's go the other side of the coin. Then we had some money laying around. We said, let's lend it out. You know, we can make some money, um, potentially, um, by lending it out and let's find someone that will do that. And we just had success with that. So it's kind of why we went that route. Dude, this is awesome. Cause as I'm listening to it, it it's literally, I mean, I just had a guy hit me up about, Oh, why do you call your thing? The experiment. And one thing I'm big on is just go along with inexperience. And it's funny because that's what you, you, your podcast is named. Mm-hmm. Shout out to uh, the real estate experience. Yeah. Not to be mistaken with the experiment, but it's the same idea. It's like, okay, let's go along with someone who's already done something. Let's learn from them. And then let's just, let's, let's double down. And it sounds like you did that. It was kind of like flipping. Okay, that didn't work. Let's find someone to guide us. Mm-hmm. Then that led to your eight unit. And now, and then it led to the introduction of, of John, which I think is fascinating. So, so now tell me, because I, I think there's, a difference between you know uh, learning whether it's through courses or theoretically or boots on the ground but like what was that learning gap for you man from like you said you knew stock brokerage obviously you you went to school you had some you mm-hmm. know education and I, I think you have like i'm pretty sure you what you have your series seven your series all that I, like i did they expired did, now, right? yeah, I did yeah. so all that stuff so now you're coming in and these guys are just kind of giving you a shot. Like, what does your day-to-day look like when you're learning? And do you feel like it was, it was, uh, I guess, accelerated from just being in the environment completely? Yeah, I mean, it was, I knew next to nothing and, you know, try to learn as quickly as you can. So it was, you know, they had some like, I forget how, but they had like some videos and stuff that they already had for me to watch to like get introduced a little bit more. And then it was literally just, trial by fire. So it was sit in the office and we're going to give you stuff to do. You're going to suck at it, but you're going to learn when we correct you. And I was like, okay, that, that works for me. I learned by doing, I'm a big experience guy. Um, like for me, when I, even when I was an athlete, I would get, I would always try to play with better players, even though it was always frustrating. Cause I, you, I pick up things when I see other people doing it. Like I consume and like, then I just regurgitate. Like, I don't think I'm a super, like creative one of a kind or like original thinker, at least not yet. I still feel like I'm in a very steep educational stage. And I think only lately have I started been expressing it more and helping other people out. But like I learn by consuming, I learn by watching, I learn by experiencing. And then I take that on and I, I try very hard not to make the same mistakes. Um, They knew I was going to make mistakes. I knew I was going to make mistakes, but it was make the mistake learn why it's a mistake and then, you know, do your best not to replicate it again. Um, so that was for me the best environment. And then also it was, I'm in the office all day with the two of them. You know, it's just the three of us. I was the first person they brought on and I just, you just learn a lot by hearing people talk. So it's, you know, eight hours a day, nine hours a day, 10 hours a day, five days a week for months on end, you just pick up whatever they're talking about and you ask questions and you hear things and you know, I was just never afraid to ask questions. Even today, I still ask questions. Like Mm -hmm. I'm still not super knowledgeable on the construction side, on the property material side. Um, You know, those two big things, essentially the debt side, I still am learning a ton about like the secondary debt market. 
Um, that's one thing I'm trying to learn a ton about right now. I just can't, I'm not afraid to ask questions, you know, like that was, you know, I, you know, when you came on, I'm doing, you know, this 30 day mini series right now. Cause it's, I'm trying to understand what everybody else is doing through this pandemic. Like I just want to ask mm-hmm. people and hear their thoughts and, you know, hear different things. And, you know, I love having, um, you know, one or two dead people on to try to understand, you know, how that world works. And cause I didn't understand the whole thing about liquidity and I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, for me, that was, you know, really steep learning curve. And I've looked back on some of like the Excel spreadsheets I've done and they are disgusting. Um, <laughs> they're so wrong. They're not even close, but it's awesome because that's, you know, that just shows like where you start and, you know, where you come from and where you are today. But yeah, being in it for me was huge. All right. Let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I think people know you, they might, I mean, they know you definitely as all the great content and information that you're producing, but like, what does the environment look like when you're, when you're being thrown into talk about the space that you're in? You said you went from eight units. Now you're transitioning to bigger units. What, what is the biggest terminologies that you had to get familiar with or, or an understanding of the, how the model works and where did you get plugged in initially mm-hmm. uh, and to, to get the ball rolling? So it's tough, right? There's so many terms that you, you know, need to learn and pick up, you know, like, cap rates a big one that people don't understand. Um, just very quickly, it's, you know, if you were to buy a deal all cash, that's what percent return you would make per year. Um, where people get confused though, is cap rates are used in the opposite way to figure out the value of a building. Right. So what, you know, just like any formula, if you have, you know, X equals Y divided by Z, you can move those letters around to find different variables. So, for that first one, I said, you know, if you buy a million dollar building that produces a hundred thousand dollars in net operating income, so income after expenses, that's a 10% cap rate. You can also do the opposite where if it makes a hundred thousand dollars and you want a property that makes you 10%, you would then pay a million dollars. So people have a tough time understanding that math behind it. But once people get through it a couple of times here, a couple of times and pick it up, it becomes pretty second nature. So a lot of it is just getting through all the terminology. Um, So if you're struggling with something, um, if you're listening right now and you're like, oh, I didn't follow at all what you said, listen to it again, listen to it a third time, go read it, go pick it up, play around with the math a little bit, either by writing it down or on an Excel sheet. And, you know, it's, it's not as intimidating as it can sound. Um, so it's, you know, it's little terms. Um, you know, I got way more familiar with like, you know, like profit and loss statements, obviously, you know, like I took accounting back in college, but you know, student athlete just kind of coasted through it. Didn't really stick. Um, so it was relearning some of that stuff. Um, you know, learned about like variance reports. So comparing your, you know, whenever you buy a property, you project out what your income and expenses are going to be. So now it's looking at, okay, did we meet those expectations? more often than not, you missed because you're net, you know, you can't project to a T what it's going to be. So it's how much did we miss by? Was it impactful? Was it not? Um, you know, things like that really, um, you know, and then you pick up, you know, little tips and tricks like, you know, the 50% expense rule is often a great way to quickly calculate buildings, income and expenses. Um, you know, you pick up little things like, you know, a lot of people want to see a 1% rule or a 2% rule, depending upon where you are which is your monthly rent divided by the cost per unit. So if the 1% rule will be 2000 average rent, you know, $200,000 per unit. Um, that doesn't necessarily really apply when you get into the bigger stuff. Um, but just little things you pick up. Um, so, I mean, it's a lot of that stuff. And then you just learn about different types of debt. You learn about equity investor raising. I mean, I, we could do a whole show on different terms. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that was definitely definitely kind of a, uh, a, a broad question. But I guess mm-hmm. for me, it, just understanding your environment, because I don't think everybody necessarily, you know, Mm. or knows or may have known exactly what you were plugged into so you're yeah. you're plugged into the multifamily space and as a as a new beginner um I, I definitely wanted to touch on okay where 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 should i begin so it sounds like yeah. uh terminology can we talk a little bit about the 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 math behind uh the the overview of what makes something a good uh asset and i want to get into we're going to get into what an asset manager is but uh, let's let's talk about the bones because I think it is simple math, but I guess is it always simple math or is there something that you've seen along the way where it's a little bit more than simple math? But 
why yeah. don't you kind of give us a little foundation and build on what what how things can get more complex mm-hmm. yeah so just real quickly as we were talking i think when you're saying like terminology is important and someone might be thinking oh well he was in that role for you know however long a day you can pick up terminology so quick just by listening to podcasts watching videos reading books um so don't think you have to be in that environment to learn it um it's just putting your hours listen and you'll pick stuff up so um Absolutely. don't stress about that um in terms of math honestly in my opinion i think people over over um complicate yeah over complicate the whole process honestly it's really did you buy the building cheap enough or not and what happened in the future people want to talk about you know IRR is going to be the most difficult formula you do, but it's a really easy formula in Excel once you know how to set it up. And there's a thousand, I'm not going to talk about it because there's a thousand resources to find it online. Um, mm-hmm. You can just go, how do I, you know, how do I calculate IRR? You can go figure it out. Um, but it's basically the same thing as an annualized return, which is your total amount of profit divided by your equity, divided by the number of years. Um, it's just a little bit more, um, sophisticated when it comes to how long it takes to hit your returns. Um, but go look it up. You can learn it pretty quickly. It's again, just like cap rate. It's not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, but honestly, all we're really doing is just basic math, adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplying, but it's about getting the right information and plugging the information into areas that make sense. So it's, you know, did, do you have the right number budgeted for, you know, roof replacements? Do you have the right number budgeted for all your expense items? Do you have the right numbers budgeted for where you can push rents to if you're planning on it? Do you have your occupancy right? And a lot of it is just, you know, were you conservative enough, right? If you think you can get the occupancy to 95% and stay there for five years and you just hit the returns you're looking for, you know, that's not as safe as the deal you underwrite to 92% and you hit the returns you're looking for. So again, it's, it's, a, it's more of a function of what are you willing to accept from a risk reward standpoint and how comfortable do you feel in that? Otherwise the math is so, so basic. Got it. So, so I'm glad you said that. Cause I think sometimes we can get caught up in, into overcomplicating things. And I, what I always like to say, if you really know what you're doing, uh, you should be able to explain to to a seven year old what it is that you do, right? And I think sometimes this is a jargon that you see in the financial world too, right? Like, what is it that you're really doing for me? You know, can you just present it in a very sim- simple terms, no jargon? So I think that's important, and I think the math helps with that. As far as what you're seeing, you said a simple math. Do you want to go a little bit about? Because I think sometimes I get caught up in making the assumption that our listeners know what we're talking about. But essentially, mm-hmm. what we're, what you're talking about, Chris, in the multifamily space is is um, you talked about vacancy for for a second. Do you want to talk about what you're looking at as far as really is it just as how much are we acquiring the asset for and how much is the asset generating an income by uh, uh, on the on per unit rent basis? Is that what it is? Like how would you summarize it? Maybe that was how I said it, but how would you yeah. summarize that? So, you know, when you're in the commercial real estate world, that term came from the word, you know, real estate for commerce. So real estate as a business in, mm-hmm. instead of residential real estate, which is real estate to reside in basically. So the difference you have to understand is these buildings should have, you know, years and years worth of financial records. So it'll tell you exactly what the property charged in rent, assuming the information is correct, exactly what they charged in rent for each unit and total, um, you know, how occupied the building was. And I'll get, I'll explain some of the stuff in a second, but um, you know, any other income sources it had, um, all the different expense items, um, what they've spent to improve the property and when, um, you know, all tons of different stuff that will be available. And what we're basically doing is looking at the property and saying, Hey, what can we do with this property? Can we make it better? Or is it as good as it can be for now? Um, is there anything wrong with the property that we have to fix that's going to become a bigger problem in the future? Um, is there anything that's you know reached its lifetime like the roofs that need to be replaced? Um, and a lot of times what we'll do too is even if the roof doesn't need to be replaced for 12 years, there's still some sort of discount associated that for every year the roof becomes older because we know even if I don't have to replace it, either I'm going to hold it long enough that I'm going to, and it's going to cost me money that needs to be factored in. Or even if I sell it before then, 
the next buyer is going to be thinking about that as well. So they're going to apply a discount for it. So the discount isn't going to be as heavy as if the roof needs to be replaced tomorrow, but there is some sort of discount factored in for those things, especially as buildings get older. So what we're really looking at in basic terms is, okay, the property is X today. What do we think the property will be in so many years? And is there anything we can do to the property to increase that? And then what we back into basically is, okay, how does that play out on both our income and the expense side? And what type of returns do we need to hit? How much money is required? Um, How much of the property can we finance? And do we feel comfortable financing? So that's a mortgage, um, just like you would on a residential home. Um, And, you know, what do our investors look for? So, you know, in terms of actual math, you know, vacancy is a percentage, um, you know, so you would multiply the total rent of all the units times, you know, whatever the occupancy rate would be. So a hundred minus whatever vacancy is. So if it was 5%, it would be 95%. Um, A lot of your other, you know, vacancy items for like concessions you give people, you know, sometimes you give people a month off to move in to incentivize them to move in. And that would also be a percentage. Um, so there you would multiply, um, you would add any additional income items, you would subtract out any expenses. Um, and then, you know, kind of your income after all your expenses and your mortgage, you would divide that by your total equity, um, which is, you know, your total cost of the project minus your mortgage, um, to kind of get your percentage return. Got it. That's that's really good. I, I like that you, you you simplify that as you're going. And I think again, the best thing people can do, and I, I would suggest too, is this looking at uh, the financials and seeing, you know, the gross operating income versus the gross potential, all that, and really seeing it. Because once you start looking at those, you'll get very familiar. And and I don't want to take them through a math class, but I think it's good. It's good that we give some perspective. Now, there's there's a lot of moving pieces, uh, obviously, and you mentioned commercial real estate. You mentioned you, you got a team. So kind of tell us where you get plugged in as an asset manager because we hear a property manager, right? We hear, yeah. you know, brokers, we hear syndicators, mm-hmm. but where do you fall in? How early in the process? How late? Can you, can you give us an insight of what an asset manager actually is? Mm-hmm. So um, I'll talk first about asset manager versus property manager. And then I'll talk a little bit more about where it plugs into the overall picture versus some of the other terms you just mentioned. Um, property manager primarily handles the day to day operations of the property. So that's collecting rent, showing vacant units, turning new units, um, overseeing general contractor stuff on a day to day basis. So, you know, did someone show up in time? Did they do the work they need to do? Um, you know, paying any expenses that are billed out, things like that. Then you'll have, if you're big enough, there's the on-site property management and there's also the corporate property management. They'll handle a little bit more of the bigger stuff. So the bookkeeping, they'll handle the hiring of your staff at the properties. Um, they'll handle a lot of is times- that, I'm sorry, is that on-site or is that, which one is, is that this is, to? So in, within property management companies, mm-hmm. there's the property management company, which is like the corporate office. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the on-site staff at every property. So on our profit and loss statement, you'll actually see two line items going towards the employees. So you'll have a management fee, mm-hmm. which is typically three, four, five percent depending upon the size and how much rent it collects. And then you'll also see a line item for payroll. And the payroll is the people that work at your property nine to five. That's their full-time job. That's what they do. Um, they're employed by the property management company, but the property itself pays them their salary and wages. So the on-site handles literally everything going on at the property day to day, all that stuff. The property management company will also handle, you know, your bookkeeping, um, your overhead for payroll. Um, They'll handle more of the contractor, subcontractor relationships. They'll help you bid out projects. Um, They'll help you underwrite deals. Um, They'll help you um, with weekly, monthly, quarterly reports. Um, a lot of that stuff. The asset manager is, you know, in a way manages the managers, but they're even more big picture. So they're coming up with the business plan overall, right? What, where I was talking about, what do we think we can do with this property? They're the ones looking at what they can do, adjusting that plan if necessary, um, analyzing other properties. 
Um, you know, we do rent surveys. We analyze the financials way more than the property manager typically um, because the way they look at it and the way the investors look at it will be slightly different. Um, we're also the intermediary for a ton of different pieces. So, um, you know, anything from the lender comes through us. Anything from insurance comes to us. Um, anything from the investors comes to us. Um, anything from the managers comes to us. We're kind of like the central hub for a lot of different pieces. Um, but basically we're setting more of the financial and big picture um, outcome for the property. We're also analyzing how long to hold the property um, or when to sell. Um, we're looking at different, you know, factors in the market and the overall, you know, country and worldwide um, and just analyzing different things. So it's definitely much more big picture from asset manager to property management, the company to the onsite staff. Um, however, you did mention a couple other things that I want to clear up. You said like, um, you mentioned syndicators as well. Syndicators can also be asset managers and frequently they are. Um, very rarely do you have a syndicator that does not also asset manage. Um, I only know of one example of hundreds because um, it doesn't make sense not to. Technically, you don't have to. The act of syndication is really just raising money as a syndicate from investors. However, you then continue to operate the property. The same thing too, a syndicator can also have a property management company under the same umbrella or in-house. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a separate company. Um, so a lot of these pieces can be in different entities, um, but a lot of them are interrelated. That's awesome. It, and I'm, I'm curious because I, I feel like an asset manager's role may look different from a property to property, or maybe in your case, it's a, at a portfolio level. So do you feel that in some cases you're more closely involved than others, depending on maybe how the capital was raised? I guess, what are some of those differences that, that you see on a, or is it pretty much flat line, like the same across the board? No, it's definitely not the same. Um, you know, heavier lifting deals that need more capital that are riskier, that are not stable, um, are way more intensive. We're talking more frequently with the managers. We're looking at the financials more frequently. Um, we want to be as proactive as we can because they are more risky. Deals that are more stable or have already spent all their budgeted capital um, or you know, don't just have a lot going on and they're just kind of maintaining ongoing operations spend significantly less time um, because the managers can handle most of the day-to-day -day stuff, which is what's really going on. Um, you know, we'll continually look at financials just to make sure things are on track. We'll continually have calls with our managers just less frequently. You know, we'll continue to do, you know, rent surveys for the area to make sure we're in line with the rest of the market. Um, but a lot of that stuff is also being done by the property management company. Um, a lot of the stuff we do, and I should have mentioned this as an asset manager is just, you know, checking a lot, you know, some of the work that the property manager is doing. So, even though they do a rent survey, you know, trust, but verify, right. They did a variance report, you know, trust, but verify, you know, make sure that what they're saying is actually true. Make sure the yeah. rent surveys are the same. Make sure you guys are on the same page with what's going on um, and things like that. So yeah. Um, yeah, definitely property to property, the amount of work and attention a property gets um, definitely changes over time. And generally when you take over, it's much higher and as things become more stable, as you get a better handle on the property, as you spend more of that capital, it tapers off and you know, less attention is required. Okay, so I'm going to get to that in a second, but you dropped so many good gems that I want to just circle back for a second before we talk about the exit sure. strategy because I think we don't talk about that enough. Mm -hmm. um, going back though, you mentioned that some syndicators or actually essentially end up being an asset manager in a case in a company like yours, where you guys are raising capital. And again, I understand that it seems like there might be some crossover and roles. Uh, but um, if someone's a GP general partner or there's multiple GPs, uh, what is that conversation uh, with that, the syndicator or, or the GP and the asset manager look like? Are you kind of reporting to them, reporting with them? Um, just just because it seems that you're the one who's who's closely in touch and I would feel like maybe a syndicator might may want to be just as close. So are you an extension to them? Or are you kind of the middleman? Or you what what was that what would that relationship look like if you're if you're raising capital? 
So here's the problem. And I hope I didn't stress that there's a difference between the two too much. If somebody's saying syndicator, they almost definitely asset manage as well. I would be, like I said, I know hundreds of syndicators. I know one off the top of my head that doesn't asset manage his own deals. And he has it look like he does, but he really doesn't. So, you know, he hired somebody, they look, it looks like they work for them, but they're, they're really a consultant. So, um, and definitely won't say who, but that's besides the point. So most syndicators you see do also asset manage. So it's very rare, like I said, that they don't. However, the word to syndicate also says you raise money. So there's plenty of people who raise money and then come onto the GP side, but they don't really asset manage. So there's tons of oh, quote unquote okay. equity raisers, yeah. Yeah. but they're not, you know, they're never going to position themselves the same way that we do. They tell people they, you know, raise money for other people's deals and, you know, they invest their own money and things like that, which if you think that sounds amazing, there's a ton and ton and ton of laws and legality more so than being a syndicator or a sponsor or a private equity fund. You have to go talk to an SEC attorney. Don't just think you can just raise money for a deal and get compensated for it. You will definitely break laws without an attorney and you'll be in the shitter if something goes wrong. So I'm just throwing that out there. And it's getting, it's getting more and more um, restrictive as well. Um, Yeah. Cause everybody and their mother wants to to raise. Exactly. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a quick disclaimer. (laughs) It's, it's not like you can just go, you know, to your family party, raise, you know, $500,000 and, you know, go be in someone's deal. So be very careful if that's the route you want to go do the proper due diligence, treat it like a real business, get the proper professionals, do it right. Um, So there is, you know, that's where you have to really understand if you are going to passively invest like with someone like us, um, you need to understand what it is we do. It's not just, Hey, I like Chris, so I'm going to invest with him. You better understand what the hell we're doing and what our expectations are and you know, what the heck we plan on doing and what role we take because everybody's a little different, right? We don't have property management in house. If that was something that was important to you, you should not invest with us. If it's not as important and you know, us and the deal are more important, that's great. That's how all of our investors feel. Um, you know, if you're looking for somebody to be a middleman between you and a deal, I would say go talk to somebody that does raise equity because they can be another stopgap and another pair of eyes on a deal that someone is raising money for. Um, whether they do a good job or not is up to your discretion, but you know, that may be something that's important to you. So just got to understand everybody in the space, especially in today's world with social media, the internet, um, how easy it is to tell somebody you are doing something and make it look like you are actually doing something. Um, it's very tough sometimes to verify. So just do some good due diligence, take your time. Don't step into something too early. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, overlapping and terminology changes. So make sure, again, do the terminology research, make sure you understand, you know, a syndicator can also be called a sponsor, can also be called a general partner, um, you know, can also be called an operator, you know, like all these terms are somewhat interchangeable. So um, just make sure you understand and you'll pick it up over time. Don't sweat it. Got it. So would you say, uh, cause you, you, I think you did a good job of summarizing of, of really how many uh, hands an, an asset manager has, has, him or him or her hands in uh, when it comes to managing the asset. Uh, but would you say you're more on the, I guess on the, on the back end of things and not so much front end with the client. So if I'm investing in, in with your company, mm-hmm. I'm not really going to see Chris that much, but I know that Chris is going to be the guy that's making things happen. Is that true or am I incorrect for thinking that? So if, if we were a bigger company, it would be more true. Um, I don't know if I said at the beginning, my title mm-hmm. is asset manager, but mm-hmm. I do basically, you know, almost everything within the company. So, you know, asset management acquisitions is just what takes up the bulk of any, you know, syndicators time, right? Yeah. Deal flow is a lifeblood. The next thing is equity raising. Um, you know, I do it to a certain degree, um, mostly because I just help out a lot with the marketing side for the company. So I also interact a lot with you know, investors, potential investors through social media. I interact with people a lot. So obviously, you know, meet investors through there as well. So um, I do. However, if we were a 30 person company and I was an asset manager, no, you would not speak to the asset manager. Um, you would probably speak to, you know, someone in the investor relations department or in the, you know, f- I don't know what you call fundraising, you know, yeah. department or whatever, but because, you know, we're, 
we're five people, we're six people. Um, you know, you can talk to anybody if you really want to. Um, but I think that's so important by the way, cause, cause I, you know, whether you're listening to this and you're working or you're trying to start something, I think it's, there's a lot that goes with, uh, uh with, with being in a company that's, um, I don't want to say it's smaller, but in a place where you can wear multiple hats because you get exposed small. too much. Yeah. But, but I think there's big, small, it's all relative. I think of course. my whole point is if you can get exposed to a lot of different roles, it all goes back to kind of you just, again, being a sponge and, and learning so mm-hmm. much along the way rather than being siloed. And, and I'm speaking from experience because I've been in on both ends mm-hmm. in a corporate world where it's kind of like you're in a bigger company and you just do this one thing mm-hmm. where in your smaller company, you're now wearing all these multiple hats and you understand things, how things operate a lot more. So, no, I think that's definitely one of the things that attracted me to it because, you know, I know a ton of people that work in bigger companies or even medium sized companies, um, you know, and you get put into a role and that's what you do. And that's great, right? Because as great as it sounds that I do a little bit of everything too, you know, sometimes things can fall through the cracks as well. And we have to make sure between our team that we over communicate, you know, within equity raising, within asset management, okay, who is handling this specific thing? Um, That's why we have different tools and resources that we use to, you know, assign tasks, make sure people are staying on top of things. But, you know, if I was just doing asset management, if something fell through the cracks of asset management, everyone could look at me and be like, Chris, what the hell are you doing? But because everyone's a little bit fluid, um, you know, there's some gray areas. So, you know, it's not just pros, there are cons as well, just like anything. Um, But yeah, that's why I wanted to work for a small company. Um, I'm very much like you. I like to taste. I like to get out there and experience different things. And even on my own. So even, you know, now that we're doing multifamily, I've looked into a ton of other things. So Toro as a company started getting into the mobile home space. Nice. Um, I've looked at doing land flipping. We looked at doing Airbnb rentals. Um, we're talking right now about, do we start exploring um, a hotel and retail because those have gotten smoked? Um, we've talked also about looking at potentially um, some small business investing because there's going to be a lot of shops being closed down and bars and, you know, laundry, you know, Absolutely. small businesses, you know, is there opportunity there for us to, you know, this only happens every several years on history, you know, even if we're not the best set up for it, you know, do we have the resources to go out and start small in those areas and add it as another, you know, arm of our company. So I'm always, you know, I'm always tasting, I'm always trying to learn, um, like I said earlier, and that was very important to me. Um, how, you know, like I said, but also, you know, cons too, right? Small businesses are definitely more risky and less stable, um, greater chance of failure. So, you know, everybody's got to realize what's best for them. Um, Absolutely. you know, if you are somebody that wants experience, but you want a, a steady W2 income check and you know, it's going to be there pretty reliably, go work for a midsize, you know, investment company that works with institutional partners. You know, we don't do that. Um, you know, go work as an asset manager, work your way up, things like that. Um, you know, like I tend to get paid pretty erratically um, and sizable checks. So I need to be, you know, disciplined to not go out and, you know, spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars just because it came in um, yeah. when we close deals and stuff like that. So, you know, that's not for everybody. A lot of people cannot budget. They're not very good with that. They get money, you know, they get their two week paycheck and they blow it in the first week. So, yeah. Um, and that's fine if that's you, um, but that's just not who I am. So I know I can deal with some of the potential cons and I think the pros far outweigh it. So, um, yeah, for me, it's great. It was phenomenal. Um, but it was also a slow process. I got paid next to nothing for a year and a half. So, yeah. um, you know, it's all about what you're looking for, what you're willing to do and, you know, all that good stuff. I love it, man. I love it. I think you, you said that real well. Before we exit out of the keep it, keeping it real uh, segment, I want to talk about speaking of exiting. Let's talk about exit strategy for a second because that's one thing I'm, I'm not as close to uh, and I would love to learn from you. Um, you mentioned the, you know, when you're, again, and I don't want to put a title. I think you're doing tons of stuff, but in your current role with Toro and, and as your, you know, your, your, your asset manager, your, your, got hands in so many different pots how have you seen uh an exit strategy is calculated is that one that is decided up front or is it does it pivot throughout the lifetime of a deal or um which one is it so you should always 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 have an exit strategy for any business plan i don't care if it's real estate i don't care if it's for a startup 
a small business, if you, if it's your own money, you can do whatever the hell you want. Right. But if you are going to, if you're going to raise money from somebody, people want to know when they're going to get their money back or a part of it or all of it and how long they're going to be in this thing. Because some people want to buy something and never sell it. And some people want to churn and burn for better or for worse. And both have their, again, neither one is wrong. It's all depends on what you have for us our exit plan is almost always to sell. And it's for two reasons. One, we found most investors want to know when the deal is going to be over for better or for worse. If the deal goes well, the deal goes poorly. They want to be out and on to the next, whether it's with us or with someone else, we've just found that to be the case. There are many people who want to stay in it for a long time. Um, we've just found the far majority of at least our investors and the people we talk to are looking for the exit to be a sale at some point. doesn't mean you can't refinance and then sell. Um, but the ultimate exit is to sell. And, and just um, to put things into perspective, it's so that they can get their money back, just making an assumption that for the folks who are listening, right? Am, am I correct there, Chris? Yes. Yeah, so on sale, obviously the first thing that's paid off is any remaining mortgage. Um, then next typically is, you know, investor capital. Um, so if there was a million dollars raised, you know, first the mortgage gets paid off, then people get their money back and then we distribute returns. So assuming the project, breaks even or, you know, produces profit, you know, mortgage, then return of capital, then investors make their return. Um, the reason, another reason we also tend to sell is the structure we have in place with our investors. Um, we, it's called a waterfall structure or also a profit sharing structure. And basically it's very similar to how it sounds as profit sharing is as the profits and the returns get higher, our company takes a bigger piece of the pie. Um, so what that means is, um, typically there's some sort of a preferred return and that's different than preferred equity, um, where it's similar to, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but where I was talking about, and I paused, I said the mortgage first, then investor capital back. If there's a, there's preferred equity and common equity, typically we only do common equity, um, which is basically they participate fully in the upside and the downside, uh, preferred mm -hmm. equity what would happen is we get paid out before common equity. However, because they're getting less downside risk, usually they have significantly less upside potential. So either it's capped at a certain return um, or they make a much smaller percentage of the upside. That's irrelevant though for this conversation, just throwing that in there. But let's say it's just debt and common equity. Um, what we'll do is usually a preferred return. And what that is, is it's saying a certain percent per year, um, typically eight, um, the investor will make 100% of the profit up until they hit an 8% return per year. So if it was one year, it'd be eight. If it was five years, it'd be 40%, so on and so forth. Over that 8% per year, then we start getting into hurdles or splits. And what that means is now that we've performed on the property, we've hit certain return metrics, we now start to take a percentage of the pie as compensation for doing well. And typically it just gets split um, by a percentage. So every dollar over that 8% per year might get split 70%, 30%. So every dollar over the 8% per year to the investor, we get split 70 cents to the investor, 30 cents to Toro as the syndicator, the GP, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You can make this as complicated or as simple as you want. So some people will just do no preferred return and just every dollar of profit gets split 90, 10 or 80, 20, whatever you want to do with your investors, 85, 15. And when I'm saying that again, it's 85%, 15%. Um, or you can make it very complicated and do, you know, multiple hurdles. So it could be an 8% preferred 70%, 30% up until the investor nets out a 14% return. So if it was a one year hold, on $100,000, it would be until they made $14,000. Um, and then it might split, you know, 60%, 40% or 50, 50, something like that. And you can mm -hmm. throw in, you know, one hurdle, you could throw in five hurdles, you could throw in 10 if you wanted and just, you know, that's over. Over complicates things, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, you got to find a good balance of what incentivizes the whole reason is right for us as the syndicator, the sponsor, whatever, as we do better, as that deal performs better, when we exit, we put more dollars in our pocket. Mm -hmm. However, you're also continuing to make a higher and higher return as we make more money. So it's a way to align interests as closely as possible 
and not just go into a deal for the profits or the fees. That being said, we also invest our own money into all the deals. So that's, you know, we are an investor as well. We're not just collecting fees and collecting money on the back end. You know, we'll invest anywhere from 10 to 50% of the equity required. Um, so our interests are totally aligned with the deal as well, but that profit sharing structure helps people feel comfortable that, you know, we are doing the best interest, not only for the investors, but for our own pocket as well, because they're almost the same thing. It's like a breath of fresh air compared to, you know, how we started the show with being a stockbroker where you didn't really feel that fulfillment mm -hmm. of where everybody wins. You really have to perform and ex exceed the expectations to actually it, even get more out of it, right? Yeah. So I don't remember. Did I mention the, the, the quick story about my aunt or no? Uh, I'm not sure that, that I recall. No. No. So when I was a stockbroker, my aunt um, is unbelievably sweet and kind hearted, um, but they're not you know, accredited investors, which yeah. when I was a stockbroker, you had to be. She called me up like a couple weeks, a month after I got um, my licenses, which is when I could start opening and making money for myself. And she asked, would it be helpful if I transferred my 401k IRA stock portfolio to you? And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. You're so kind, but no, don't do that. Yeah. Um, and when that happened, I was like, if I'm not even willing to take your own, my, my own family's <laughs> retirement money, if I don't feel that confident, I'm not in the right space. So that was for me, that Good was like, you. that was like the last switch I turned. I didn't leave right that instant. Like I said, I, I waited a little bit longer to try to find a new job, but now I know if any of my family called me up and asked about it, I would make sure I explained everything and make sure they understood the process of everything. Um, but I would a hundred percent, you know, you know, allow them or be okay with them investing into any of our deals because I'm investing in all the deals. And look, I may be wrong in every single one of them. I don't think that's a high likelihood. So I would, you know, the two scenarios combined are, you know, very different. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's real refreshing. Mm -hmm. So when they're keeping it real, I want to hear more about Chris. So, you sure. know what, uh, look, you're, you're, you're a hustler, you're an entrepreneur, you're, uh, you're doing a lot. You're an education first mastery, which I love about you. Uh, what do you think is the biggest misconception? I think you touched on it in the beginning, but I won't put words into your mouth re regarding your journey when you started flipping and that didn't work out. What, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about, you know, attaining or getting to that level where if it's my first 50 units, my first flip, or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? You want to, do you want to give us your insight on what that biggest misconception is that you th feel people have with attaining, a, a leap towards their goals. Yeah. Unless you got family with some money, it's going to take you way longer than you thought. Yeah. But once you do finally get there, it's going to feel way shorter than it actually was. Um, you know, it feels sometimes like this, you know, these four years went by in the blink of an eye. Um, but I can tell you it took a long time for me to, you know, start making decent money, let alone good money took me a long time, you know, even when I was at Toro, it felt me a long, it took me a long time before I really understood the business. I really understood where I was talking about and, you know, I could communicate it effectively with other people, whether it's investors, brokers, agents, family members, you know, you name it. Um, you know, that stuff takes time. Um, and a lot of people don't want to plan for the long term or don't want to get into something for the long term. They want the quick, easy money, which is why, you know, there's so many, you know, MLMs, so many quick money scams and stuff like that. Um, you know, real estate in general is a long game. Um, it's a game that also takes money. I think, you know, anybody looking to get involved, you know, I think no money down real estate or, you know, zero money out of pocket real estate doesn't really exist because even to find those properties, it's going to take money. And if it doesn't take money, it's going to take a ton of time, which equates to money. So, yeah. you know, there won't, you know, Six and one half a dozen the other. So, you know, I'm glad look, you said you that. <laughs> and look, if you don't if you don't have money and you're willing to put up a lot of time, that's okay. But just understand you could be spending that time making money in other ways and putting that into real estate. And there's neither one is better than the other. People just need to understand that just because you are not physically taking a dollar and putting in into a property, there's something called sweat equity. And your sweat equity, you could make there's a great story. We had a guy on on our podcast. Um, his, his name is Joe Colasuno. Um, if you don't follow him on Instagram, you should, you know, like 400 units in Allentown, Pennsylvania, all his and his brother's own money. Um, he said the worst deal he's ever bought, he made a hundred thousand dollars on. 
made $100,000 on. The worst deal he's ever bought, made $100,000 on. <laughs> he said the amount of time, energy, and effort it took for that deal, he said he, might as, he would have rather lost money and spent less time because his you know, rate per hour was next to zero. So yeah, Absolutely. great. He made $100,000. But not only did he, his per hour cost be next to nothing, there's also something called opportunity cost where all that time he spent on that property, whether it was 40 hours, 400 hours, or 4,000 hours, I didn't ask him. He could have spent all that time finding another property that would have taken significantly less time and also made him 100,000. Or he could have found two of those or three of those or five of those or 10 of those. So a lot of people say, hey, you know, they just look at the time and money they're spending on that activity. They don't think about the opportunity cost of what you're missing by spending that time and money. So don't get too caught up in, you know, no money real estate. Take it slow, take it steady, plan for the long term. It's going to feel like forever today. Um, But in the long run, you'll be happy you did it. That's dope, man. What do you think? I mean, that was, that was good advice for us. What do you think is the, 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 uh, the worst advice you've, you've ever received? Cause I know there's a lot of noise out there you've ever heard of. Uh, what do you, what do you think is we, we talk about the quick wins a little bit mm-hmm. or, or get rich quick, whatever. Yeah. What are your, what do you think is out there? And maybe specifically, cause I think you're doing a fantastic job of covering so many Thank individuals you, in your, you. your, your space. So what's you the biggest too, misconception? Thank you, man. What, what do you think that is that you even heard from maybe a guru and you're like, yeah, I don't know. So I don't have the, I think, it's not the, I'm going to go two ways. So the, there's the biggest misconception, which I think is more important. And the worst piece of advice is that bigger is always better. I don't think that's true at all. Okay. Um, which you hear a lot of people talk yeah. about, whether it's Grant Cardone or, you know, yeah. a ton of other guys that are, you know, selling courses or things like that. Bigger is not always better. It depends on what you're looking to accomplish. It, everything literally in this business comes back to pros and cons, risk reward, and your personal appetite. There is, no, there is no wrong way to do this business. There's no right way to do this business. It all comes back to what you want to accomplish and understanding which vehicle best fits for you and understanding also that you're not going to know until you start trying it. And that's why you know it took me from flipping to tax deeds to small multifamily to large multifamily to figure it out. Um, the biggest misconception though um, that I have, and I think a lot of people are going to learn it the hard way, is a lot of people feel if a bank is willing to give me X amount of debt on a property, why wouldn't I take the maximum amount? And I think that's a recipe for disaster because just because some moron at a bank thinks a loan is safe doesn't mean your property can support that loan if something happens or something you overlooked happens. And we just look at 2008 and it's the perfect example, but I've been fighting that battle and that misconception for two, two and a half years of people saying, well, if I can get you know, 80% on a property, why wouldn't I take it? If I can get 90% on a property, why wouldn't I take it? Because if you miss one month of rent, you're screwed or and, and- your CapEx isn't high enough or your expenses are too low. Um, you know, there is a such thing as over leveraging a property. And I don't think enough people give credit to the risk associated with deals and how the risk weighs up against the reward. That's so interesting because uh, I'm glad you said that. But do, do you think that that all goes back to who you're surrounding yourself with? Because I, I know a few lenders who are in this space as well who may kind of flag you. So would you piggyback care. that comment and think that um, you're, you're basically going back and saying, no, you got to do your own due diligence? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Always, it, there should be not a single piece of information you get that you aren't verifying. I don't care if it's a contractor bid. I don't care if it's a lending quote. I don't care if it's an insurance quote. I don't care if it's a property management quote. You should either go get it bid out multiple times, go get references multiple times, ask other owners, people what they do and what they've experienced and things like that. Cause any idiot can get a job and tell you one thing and have no idea what they're doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're going to see right now, tons of people all of a sudden, you know, can't pay rent. Well, guess what? If you can't get forbearance on your loan, you're going to, you're going to have to pay it. And if you have a recourse loan, if you can't pay it, guess what? You just lost your property. So yeah. would you rather keep your property and just had to wait an extra year for the equity to buy it and be safer? Or would you rather over leverage and potentially lose it? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. You just have to understand the risk associated with it. If you're willing to accept that risk and you understand it, fantastic. But don't, the answer shouldn't have been, if I said, hey, 
I don't, if someone came to me and said, Hey, what do you think about the ceiling? I said, Hey, I think you're over leveraged. And they go, what do you mean? Why would I take less if the bank's willing to give me? The answer should have been, yeah, I'm, I'm being pretty risky on my loan, but I think the reward is worth it. And I think, you know, in a couple of years, it'll pay off. I'd be a hundred percent okay with that answer because yeah. that's up to you. That's your call. That's your judgment. That's whatever. But when you don't understand the metrics behind it, that's the problem. Mm. Always, always have a, you need to make sure you understand why you're doing something. You're not doing it just because. Because it's, someone's telling you, you can, that, that is a problem because a lot of people do not understand how it works and do not understand what you're looking to accomplish. Lenders only goal is to get as much money lent to that property so they can make their commission for the most part. There's a ton of great lenders out there who also care about your best interest. However, they may also not fully understand your best interest. No one's going to know what you want to accomplish better than yourself. You could be the best communicator in the world. You could spend, you know, 40 hours communicating what you want to do with this property, your vision and everything. But after you have that conversation, something could happen and that could change. So you need to understand why you are doing something and what the mechanics behind it are to make the best decision for you. Don't, you know, don't listen to somebody else unless you understand why you're doing it and you're okay with it. Dope, man. That's dope. Man, with that said, I just dropped the mic right there. But uh, let's right before we head out, man, let's get you the core rapid fire questions. Uh, sure, what's, what's the, um, what is your favorite? Do you have a favorite part? You know, you've been experiencing, experimenting in my world, a lot of different things uh, on a day-to-day. What do you think is your favorite thing to do uh, in, in your day-to-day with, with your hands and so many things? I think, you know, underwriting a new deal is always fun because it's something new, it's exciting, and you're trying to figure something out. I really like trying to figure things out, whether it's, you know, whether it's real estate, it's a new avenue, just, you know, some piece of technology, um, you know, figuring things out for me is a ton of fun. It's a process, it's a journey, it's frustrating, but once you get through it, it's awesome. Um, so trying to figure out how to make a property work um, is definitely exciting in that regard. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that's probably the biggest one. That's awesome. Do you have who, uh, what's the best habit that serves you every day, Chris? The best habit that serves me every day. It's one I don't do enough, but when I have something I need to do, it's writing it down and putting it into a system that reminds me to do it because I don't have the best memory. Um, so for me, it's very important to write things down. So I remember them, take care of them when they need to do, um, and stay on top of my task because otherwise things will slip through the cracks and I'll forget about them. Uh, speaking of, do you have like a best tool or an application that you, you yeah, want to Yeah, so to? you're smiling because you know, but yeah, we just started using, uh, it's called monday.com. Um, it's not free, so it's not for everybody, but it's not super expensive, um, but it's really good. It's really user-friendly and also robust. So you can find ones that are simpler. You can find ones that are way more complex. We just felt it was a really good blend of user-friendly, robust, and also it just looks pretty cool too. So yeah, that's what we use. Awesome. Do you have a favorite creator out there, an influencer of yours that you, that has had a big impact on you? Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, it's Gary Vee. I mean, that guy just changed my entire mindset, made me realize how to go long, um, made me realize how to take things slow, not carry, you know, not care about what other people think. Um, So yeah, definitely number one impact from a, you know, not somebody I know, you know, directly. Absolutely. I think you're doing a good job, my man. I think you, you. you are, you've impacted us. Uh, one 300 unit apartment, Chris, or three apartments of a hundred units. If you could pick. That's tough. So, and the reason it's tough for me, so you're talking about a hundred three unit complexes, right? Yep. Or one 300 unit complex. I think I would go a hundred three unit complexes. And the reason being, I think diversification is massive. Um, Oh, so interesting you said that because I actually was saying three of a hundred units, a one hundred unit oh. apartment. So I mean, oh, so three, oh, concept. so three one hundreds. Yeah, three one hundreds. Oh, three one hundreds all day. That's not even a question. Interesting, interesting. Because uh, why is the, that? The reason I wasn't sure about the the one hundred three units versus the three hundred yeah, unit actually, property, yeah. it's significantly easier to invest wherever and have somebody manage it when it's eighty, a hundred, three hundred units. Yeah. Three unit properties can get tough. Oh, yeah. um, so I would I, definitely I'm, go because, because yeah. for me, I could buy, 
I could buy three 100 unit properties in three different areas and three different type of assets and feel really secure from a diversification standpoint. No. Um, I don't want all my money into one space. I don't even have all my money into real estate. Um, yeah. And that's why for me, it's really interesting to look at land, mobile home parks, retail, hotel, small business, things like that. Um, you know, because I think, you know, multiple streams of revenue being in different places um, is so, so, so important. It's going to level out what your returns can be. It's going to be tougher to make really big pops that, you know, drastically increase your net worth. But like I said, I'm in it for, you know, the next 30, 40 years. I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. Um, so for me that, you know, the long term is, you know, the long term vision is more important. Preserving that capital is much more important than, you know, maximizing every single cent and dollar. Cool, man. Class A or class C? I would say right now class C because I know it better and I uh-huh. think I can get a better value for my money right now. Um, however, if I was buying three 100 unit properties and I had the money to go do it, one of those would be a class A asset somewhere. Good for you, man. That's a great answer. Self-manage or outsource? I would love to self-manage. Um, Cause I think one of the biggest issues we have with third party management is a third party. And it's, it's not their fault. It's just the way the system's built. They have multiple clients. So they have to come up with systems and processes to handle all those clients. So if we would like something done a certain way, sometimes they'll say yes. Sometimes they'll say no, because they have to service multiple clients and they don't want multiple systems. So from that standpoint, it's tough. So I would prefer to have it internal because I think we could do things better from the standpoint of systems processes staying organized. Um, however, it's also significantly easier to fire and change if you have it as a third party company. So back to pros and cons, but right now I'm leaning towards having it internal. That being said, I've never personally experienced having property management in house. So if I went to some place that did, my attitude might change. Great answer. That's a good answer. If you had one superpower in real estate with what you're doing right now, what do you think it would you you would want it to be? I mean, know the future. That's the easiest answer in the world. You know the future, you'd you'd be. It, that would also take the fun out of it, though. I mean, if you knew exactly what was going to happen, you know, it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel. Where's the fun in that? Um, but you know, if you were just concerned about maximizing every dollar, you know, knowing the future, you'd know exactly which property. You know, you know, you could time the bottom and the top and you'd be rich. So, um, so interesting that you say that. Cause if you don't mind me, I'm, I, I got to jump in on this fun one. I always, my answer to that is always, uh, convincing people, right? If I can convince you, if, if I could convince you to let me in on a deal, if I can mm-hmm. give, convince a lender to give me money, if I can give, convince the owner to sell the property to me, not the mm-hmm. 10 other buyers. It, it'd be great at the start. <laughs> But when I think about it again, in a year, you'd be so bored because you'd pick up the phone and ask, (laughs) yeah, you'd pick up the phone and ask one person and you just hear, yes, you just hear, yes, yes, you can do it. Yes, you can do that. I'll take that any day. Maybe Chris doesn't want to hear yeses, but in in this this experiment, you heard a lot of no's and I can't wait till you hear a lot of yeses, guys. Yeah. But you say that now, but it would be, it would be very boring because it's, where's the challenge? Where's the excitement, right? If you didn't want challenge, if you didn't want excitement, we wouldn't be doing what we were doing. You'd, yeah, you'd no, be working and, a totally and, different job. Um, yeah, and that, that you're so right. And I think that's why it's so important to be like fulfilled because mm-hmm. I feel like that's why a lot of uh, people who have high success fall off. Like if you think about being successful and being powerful or whatever projected, you probably hear a lot less no's. You got a bunch of yes men around you. You got a bunch of yeses people want to. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting. Now we get into some kind of like some real personal development kind of like rooted core values or whatever, but, uh, interesting, man. Cool. So if you could describe one successful investor being, it could be what you're doing, uh, Toro's doing syndicator asset manager in one word or entrepreneur, even which one word do you think you would pick? I'm not sure. I understand the question. Uh, basically if you, uh, could describe a successful investor Mm -hmm. in one word, what do you Uh, think that one word would be? Persistent. Nice. Nice. Cross the board just like that. 
man just like that insider secrets what do you think uh look we've we've been through a lot right now i want to wrap up this show you crushed it with value as always uh what are your current thoughts on i know this has been a big conversation just want to hear from the inside of it's kind of a day-to-day mm-hmm. uh what are your thoughts on what's currently going and what you know are you guys playing day-to-day i know we've yeah. been asking that question it's very it's getting to the point where it's kind of like beating a dead horse at this point but look what are your thoughts on what's currently happening and do you have you guys have any insights when you're talking internally of how you guys want to adapt which i know it's been a big thing mm-hmm. yeah i think you know th- we can do a whole episode just on that right but just mm-hmm. you know to gloss over it i think yes it's 100 percent day-to-day week-to-week um you know i try to think about what it was like two weeks ago three <laughs> weeks ago you know four days ago um not only is the market just rapidly changing um, I'm noticing too, just internally, my thoughts and feelings about the future and stuff like that is changing so drastically just because there is so much uncertainty. And I hear, you know, a couple pieces of news that makes me feel more negative or a couple of pieces of news that make me feel more positive and optimistic. So, um, you know, personally trying to do the best I can to stay level headed, control yeah. the things I can control. Um, and that's, you know, all we can do, right? We can't change the market, can't change what the government's doing, um, can only control what we're doing. Um, some of the things we're doing, um, you know, first thing we did was put together a resource package for all of our tenants, make sure they're taken care of. They know what resources are out them for them, not only federally, but, you know, on a state level and also locally and not even from the government, just, you know, food banks, food drives, whatever. Um, then it's making sure they understand the process of having to get their stimulus checks, how to file for unemployment if they have been affected, um, you know, things like that. So that was our main focus, right? We basically hunkered down. We went into a shell and said, we've got to take care of what we got to take care of because what we have is more important than the deal we potentially have. Um, So that was our number one focus and still remains our number one focus. Um, From there, you know, we're looking at things, you know, like the the stimulus checks, we're looking at, you know, the unemployment process. Um, You know, so a lot of people don't realize that it's normal unemployment checks plus an extra 600 bucks a week. Um, so for us, that's very good because our average rent is about $750. Mm-hmm. Most of our tenants would qualify just receiving the extra. All of our tenants would qualify just by receiving the extra $600 per month. Um, cause we require, um, rent be no more than three time income be no more than th- has to be more than three times the average rent. So if it was yeah. 2,400 bucks, which would be 600 times four, that would qualify for an 800 average rent. Our average rent is 750 bucks. We should be good for most of our units. Nice. Um, so that is something that we have always known about being in the C space is being lower. The dollars are just lower. And, you know, if something happens, um, you know, more people can afford it. Whether they want to live there or not for that price is up for debate. Um, but that's, we've always felt that that gives some security and it's been nice to be proven right. You have a 2,500 average rent in New York city, yeah, you know, a $1,200, $1,200 stimulus check and 600 bucks a week is not going that far. So, yeah. um, it's all relative, um, making sure all our, all of our employees are taken care of. So we implemented social distancing very quick. Um, we locked down all our leasing offices. We turned maintenance to emergencies only. Um, we only did work outside of emergencies on totally vacant units. Um, a lot of our contractors slowed down except in areas where they needed to continue. Um, so a lot of that stuff took place. Um, we offered a bunch of concessions to people that needed it. Um, but in terms of what we're looking at now, um, April wasn't as bad as a lot of people thought it was going to be. Um, it was kind of where we thought it was going to shake out, you know, where our collections have been, you know, on average, probably 5% lower than what they've been. Um, and just to be clear, um, collections, you could be 90% and be a hundred percent collected. So collected is of how much you bill out. It's not necessarily a reflection of the total possible number. Um, so it's not, it's not, you know, 90% of if every unit was rented at full price, it's 90% of the number of units that are rented at their current rent. Um, Mm. which is not, it's not a bad thing. It's just, that's the reflection. So Good Uh, distinction. Yeah. Yeah. So we've only been a couple percentage points lower on our collection rate. Um, However, 
a lot of people have been unable to claim unemployment and get through the system. So we think that's backed up a lot of people. Um, so there's a good shot. A lot of people that have said they can't pay right now will be able to pay in May as they get backfilled. Um, so we're going to see what happens there. Some people, a lot of people are starting to get their stimulus checks now. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, you know, the flattening of the curve and what does that mean? Um, we looked at the federal government put out like a 20 page deck on how they're planning to reopen the country, excuse me, but it was pretty unhelpful. So I wouldn't even waste your <laughs> time. Um, it didn't really give a lot of information, but it does tell you basically all it tells you high level is that it's not, they're going to flip a switch tomorrow. It's the more important jobs and the people that need to be there in person are going to be the ones that go back to work first. Basically they're going to encourage anybody that can work from home to continue to do so for the foreseeable future until there's, you know, until there's a vaccine or basically everyone's been infected and now, you know, immune, if that's even possible. Um, We're closely watching. There's been some rumors of people can become reinfected. So that's, cropped up out of China. So we're watching that to see if that's confirmed or not from the CDC and who, um, we are carefully watching all the, you know, all the different programs they're putting together for small businesses, um, and things like that from the U S government. Um, we are watching, uh, what else? Um, we've talked to all our lenders, um, just letting them know that, if we don't have to, we, we won't be t- taking forbearance. We've only had to do it on one property so far. Um, and the rest we haven't needed it so far. So, I mean, there's a lot, right? I could talk for another 10 minutes. Hey, Chris, thing, but. you're, you're, you are a machine, man. Like I'm going to forget the news. I'm going straight to you in the future. And uh, listen, you guys should, don't if you guys are following <laughs> Chris Grenzig right now on every social media platform possible, Please do because he's um, he's he offers me value. I'm like literally, I have some posts. Kid you not, mm-hmm. if you check my Instagram, save because I'm like, oh shit, I gotta watch this, and and there's just so much stuff that uh, I want to literally salute to you for that because I think you're crushing it. And uh, but if I didn't mention it, where else can people find out more about you, man? Yeah, so um, like you said, I'm on basically every social media platform. Um, you just search Chris Grenzig, but. The main one I'm on is really uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. So it's Instagram is at Chris Grenzig. LinkedIn is just Chris Grenzig. You can find me, um, but we're on Facebook. Uh, we have our own podcast. It's called the real estate investing experience. Like you alluded to, um, you can find it on everything um, or you can go to the R E I E X P.com and you can find your favorite platforms. Um, we just launched our own Facebook group called the real estate investing experience, which I'm super excited about because I think it's going to be a really great way to interact with people more instead of just, in comments and DMS, I think it'll be people given, you know, helping each other out, lifting each other up. So we're, we're trying to learn there and build that up. So, um, definitely go check that out. Um, or you can email me, right. If you just got a direct question, you want to hit me up. Uh, my email is Chris at Toro rep.com. That's also our company website, Toro rep.com. You can go check us out there. Um, learn more about the company properties we've bought, stuff like that. Um, and that's really it. I mean, I know it's a lot, but you know, that hit me up. Was- I can direct you wherever you need to go. That was fantastic, guys. And thank you so much, Chris, again, for dropping so much value and that no better practitioner than the man himself. Again, congratulations on your 117 unit that you guys you, and boys you. just closed. That's, that's big. And we'll continue to follow the incredible things that you're doing. Just like that, we are out.